Space, the final frontier. This is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Its mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Hello and welcome to episode 171 of the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. My name is Tim Robertson. I'm the host of the podcast and also the coordinator of the training program within the Alpo. Thank you for downloading and listening. And if you like this podcast, please give it a thumbs up and a like. I really appreciate it. The Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers collects and analyzes observations of various solar system bodies and associated phenomena, and publishes detailed reports concerning these bodies in its quarterly publication, The Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. This podcast depends upon donations from you, our listeners, to keep it going. If you enjoy what you hear in the podcast, you can donate to it via Patreon. You can start by giving as little as $1 a month. If you feel even more generous, for $5, you receive early access to the podcast before it goes public. For a monthly donation of $10, you receive a copy of the Novice Observer's Handbook. And for $35 a month, you receive producer credits on the podcast. You can find out more at www.patreon.com slash Observer's Notebook. And if you'd like to join the Alpo, membership begins at $22 a year. For more information, find us on the internet at www.alpo-astronomy.org. And we are also on the Facebook. Just search for ALPO Astronomy. And this podcast also has a Facebook page as well. Just search for Observer's Notebook. And if you enjoy what you hear on the podcast, please subscribe. That way you'll never miss another episode. And now episode 171. And we're starting a new little series to talk about locations where you can observe the 2024 total solar eclipse. This time, Rochester, New York. Enjoy. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to this edition of the Observer's Notebook podcast. And today we're starting a little mini-series where we're talking to areas across the country that will be holding events for the April 8th, 2024 total solar eclipse. And we're going to kick that off today with uh, Rochester, New York, and we're going to be speaking to Dan Schneiderman. Welcome to the podcast, Dan. Thanks for having me. Now, what's your experience in astronomy or with eclipses or anything like that? So I don't have any formal background, but I've always been an amateur astronomer, uh, you know, growing up on the edge of uh, rural farmland. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of stargazing as a kid. I grew up going to the RMSC Strassenburg Planetarium, uh, which is where my office now is. And I still can't believe that. Uh, Just I remember inhaling everything space I could as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know that's an extremely common story, but mm-hmm. it's it was just so much fun. And I've always just followed, you know, as a kid, I followed a lot of the shuttle launches. I've never seen a shuttle launch in person. That's um, to see a launch period is on my to do list, but mm-hmm. just kind of grew up with that. I did not get to experience totality during 2017. Okay. This will be my first total. But I have experienced several, a number of lunar eclipses. Okay. And two partials. Okay. Yeah, we, you'll never forget your first total solar eclipse, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the organization you work for, it's the, what's it called? Uh, the, Rochester, uh, the Rochester Museum and Science Center. Okay. And that's the one that's putting on this whole event? Uh, One of the big events out of Rochester. Okay. So let's talk about Rochester, New York. Um, What's the approximate uh, population of the city? So the city itself is about 250,000, 300,000, but the metro population is about 1.1 million. Okay. And you guys are right smack in the center line. Right in the center? Well, I will say the city is like ever so slightly off. This is getting a little nitpicky. Okay. If you were to go maybe 20, 
25 minutes to the west of us in Brockport, you'll be dead, dead center. But uh, we work with a lot of the folks out in Brockport, uh, specifically SUNY Brockport, who we have been a very, very strong partnership with. Okay. So uh, have, have you guys looked ahead to the weather predictions for next April? Oh, yes. That is probably my number one question I've received on. I'm not quite at a daily basis yet, <laughs> but I would say at least every other day or when I do outreach events, out promoting the eclipse, I'll receive it no less than 50 times in a day. Mm. It's We know that when a lot of people think of Rochester in mm -hmm. April, a lot of people think, you know, possibility of snow, heavy clouds, and yeah, I would say on average, it is a fairly cloudy place, but the percentages are in our favor. And when you look at the averages, you don't see the microclimates that we have along Lake Ontario. So if you're right on the lake, it's your chances do improve quite a bit. Uh, one of my favorite examples weather-wise locally is if you're to look at some of the snowstorms that go through the region that, you know, we'll dump five, six feet of snow in Buffalo, mm -hmm. we'll get only a couple inches, if that. Okay. And it's it, it does come down to, you know, zooming in quite a bit more. Okay. But, you know, no matter what, we are planning on going big, rain, rain or shine. Good. Good. Well, that's, that's what you have to do with this type of event. Now, um, what are what are you expecting the attendance to be for the events you have? So, for the overall region, we're expecting anywhere between three hundred and five hundred thousand additional visitors. Uh, and then at the RMSC for our multi day festival, we're aiming between eight to ten thousand people per day, and oh. both of those numbers are based off of what happened in twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. If you were to talk to any museum back in 2017, they would say plan for a certain amount and then just continue adding oh. on people. Yeah, I did the it, same type of series back in 2017, and every single location grossly underestimated <laughs> the traffic that they would have in their area. So it's it's one thing you really need to consider. That is thankfully why we've been talking about traffic uh, since 2018. Team. Okay. So in Rochester, we've had a, a larger task force, which the RMSE has been co-chairing with uh, Visit Rochester or Tourism Bureau, the Genesee Transportation Council, which brings together a lot of the transportation agencies, and Deb Ross from Kids Out and About, who now sits on the AAS Eclipse Task Force. So all of us together have been kind of like working on this for years in the transportation sector, you know. Even before talking to the RMSC and learning about the eclipse, attended a transportation uh, conference, and one of the sessions was about the eclipse. They saw that Rochester was directly in the path, and they're like, oh, we got to start preparing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they've been working alongside the RMSC since, uh, along with our tourism bureau, we've, we've been really lucky to have everyone on board. That's good. Yeah, that's one thing I don't think anybody really planned for last time. I know I was up in Madras, Oregon, and when the eclipse ended, I was in I was in a vacant field with five hundred other cars. And when the eclipse ended, we all decided to leave, and it took us ten hours to go one hundred miles. It, it was not a fun yeah. drive. It was not fun. We, so we are preparing. In fact, we're uh, one of the big things that we're doing with a lot of our stakeholders and other event organizers is saying. Keep everyone busy, whatever we can do mm -hmm. to, you know, offset that traffic. That's the way to go. And in fact, we even went as far as getting all of our region schools canceled that day. Oh, wow. As that is a, a Monday and totality hits us at 3.20 p.m., which is a big time for uh, schools to let out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were like, hey, we don't want any kids stuck on a bus missing out on the eclipse. Right. B, we don't want them stuck in traffic during right after the eclipse because we know how bad that traffic situation is and you don't want kids stuck on buses for hours. Uh, so we were like, let's talk about the safety. Let's work with all the schools. 
Uh, we tried pushing for the entire state. That didn't quite work out, but we were able to get uh, almost every school district canceled uh, for the nine counties. That's and we've that's, been. That's really thinking ahead, right there. That's really good. Uh, we have come up as we've been talking. We have run into like so many different routes that we had never thought about of like how to defer traffic. No. Uh, we're trying to get in touch with the funeral industry because we don't want any funeral processions to take place that day. Hmm. We're talking about pre, a lot of pre-deployment of tow trucks. Uh, no matter, even if it is sunny out, it's still going to be muddy. So we're worried about, you know, trucks, uh, cars and trucks pulling up onto the side of the road and not being able to get back out. Uh, we're worried about all the ambulances, creating safety routes. Uh, it's a lot of the transportation is behind a lot of what we've been doing of trying to decentralize as many events as possible. That's smart. Very smart. Now, what about lodging? And do you have camping available in the area, too, for people that are coming in? Yeah, we've had different campsites pop up. Uh, the tricky part for camping is, well, and I know that this is going to be an, it, not the weather. Most people, well, part of the weather. Most people don't open their campsites until May in the mm. region. And that's partially because they don't turn their water on oh. later on. You have to worry about pipes freezing. Right. Uh, we do know that some campsites will be available. That's okay. being worked out, thankfully. Okay. Uh, but not everyone. And I believe most, if not all, the state parks are passing on camping there. But that's not to say some people... I know some people are opening up their field. Some people are opening up other campsites. The Finger Lakes region has a ton of camping. So we're still expecting for that. Okay. Uh, yeah. For lot general lodging and hotels, I mean, I've been getting hotel requests for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had to tell people, A, most hotels don't open up until a year out. That's just kind of the standard. But... We have been getting, we've been working with hotels heavily thanks to our mm -hmm. tourism bureau of saying, hey, you're going to want packages. You're going to want to, you know, maybe think about having different minimum stays so that people stay a certain amount of time. Uh, I've been talking to hotels as far as an hour and a half, two hours away, even outside of the path, mm -hmm. just saying there's only a certain amount of hotels. And if you look at where Rochester is, well, Buffalo is to the west of us. Syracuse is to the east of us. Syracuse gets about a minute and a half. Buffalo gets a few seconds more than us. So they get around uh, three minutes and like 40, uh, like in the mid to upper 40 seconds. There's only a certain amount of hotels right. in the region. So we know people will be traveling most likely from the southern tier and going north. Yeah, Which I'm, honestly works out really well if you know the weather changes in one area or another. Yeah, I'm seeing reports from a lot of different areas of uh, I won't call it gouging, but gouging <laughs> the prices of hotel rooms and things like that. I've seen it with campsites too. That's just all over the country that they're really jacking up the prices. I have unfortunately seen that too. Yeah, that's, um, that's tough. It it is tough, and I mean. Admittedly, I've been pushing for people to house other, uh, their friends and family, you yeah. know, even to reduce. I've seen a lot of people already, you know, start setting up the Airbnbs. Mm. Thinking about other possible methods to house people. Well, I know locally we just had a major tourism event. We had the PGA here in Rochester uh, literally last week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the house, the, Housing situation was figured out. People coming in from a distance, busing, a whole, the whole thing. Okay, but that's why I'm telling people it may be worth driving an hour and a half, two hours out as well. Now, on your website, do you have a list of lodging areas? Not yet. We've been gathering up the packages, okay, and we've been pointing people to our tourism friends who work with all the hotels uh, on a much more regular basis. So they can get all that information out. And thankfully, our hotels have been attending our task force meetings and partnering up. Okay. Now, it looks like your major event, of one, one of your major events is uh, Rock the Eclipse 2024. 
Yep, that will be the multi-day festival that we're having at the RMSC. So talk about that. What, what kind of events within this festival will you have? So this is heavily inspired by the Nashville Eclipse Festival and uh, uh, the festival held in Nashville and inspired by the At the Planetarium. So we're going to have a main stage working on bringing in speakers, both science communicators, historians. Uh, we're working with uh, artists locally, musicians locally. I am putting in my request for our big name science communicators uh, and former astronauts. Okay. You know, that all comes down to fundraising. Right. Uh, uh, of course, we'll have telescopes. We have a science on a sphere at the RMSC. So that's one of those spheres that uh, is projected onto. It's almost like an inverse planetarium. Hmm. They're really fun to look at. Uh, you can do some fun mapping of Earth on it. I know back in 2017, NOAA produced eclipse shows for these science on the spheres, and we're working with them to update further 2023 and 2024. We also have our planetarium, which is uh, the Schessenberg Planetarium. Well, I want to say it's the third largest in New York State. It's about 65 feet in diameter, 45 feet tall. We ha will be having eclipse shows running almost every 20 minutes. No. Oh. We are planning on doing like maybe a VIP event on Friday night, a Yuri's night on Saturday night, telescopes, moon bounces, tons of hands-on activities happening in the local colleges for a lot of their clubs and groups. We're trying to think of everything. Oh, we have uh, singing Tesla coils at the museum. And so we're looking into what a Eclipse Tesla coil show would be. Hmm. Uh, we're thinking about adding in some comedy, maybe there's music being written for the Eclipse locally, so we're working with those groups. Not to be oh, wow. played on the day of. Uh, well, not to be played during totality, but throughout the day and throughout mm -hmm. the weekend. Okay. So have, and you then, have you booked any acts or anything like that you can talk about right now? Unfortunately, speakers? still in the process. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of speakers from our co local colleges. Uh, we are working with uh, some of our indigenous groups in the area, such as Kanonigan, as according to oral tradition, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was actually founded under a total solar eclipse. Oh. So that's a bit of New York State history that we're trying to tap into. Very cool. You could have local dancers and things like that, then that type of thing. But we're still working on that fundraising, but before we can announce any big speakers. Okay. I've so, been so, chatting with agents, but okay. So what are the dates of the event? So it will be uh we're trying to figure out how much we're gonna be open on April fifth, but it will be heavily the sixth, seventh, and of course the eighth. Mm -hmm. Then ending on the eighth? Yeah, so we'll do, uh, you know, go into the evening on the 8th. Okay, great. And you're setting up uh, meal packages or restaurants to cater meals and things like that for the whole event? Oh, yes. We're talking to different caterers right now. There's already Eclipse chocolate that's you can buy now, which is fantastic, uh, along with Eclipse wine. Different breweries are working together. Uh, we've been talking to distillers or distilleries. Everyone's on board. It's the easiest thing. The question is, how many people can we fit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what about public parking? That we we're trying to figure out because we're going to have to shuttle people in. And what's great about our location is we're about one block away from the Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester, two blocks away from the George Eastman Museum. And so we're going to have shuttles. So that, you know, there's, you know, all of these museums in one area. But we know that other events and festivals will be taking a place across the region, which we're supporting by, you know, helping out with training, providing some materials, the glasses, all of that. Wow. And so we'll be having people, you know, hop around. This is part of our decentralizing. It just okay. hit me. I forgot one, uh, two of the other things that we'll have, because I usually associate them more with more of our outreach but of course we're going to have them at the festival so uh, uh this past april 8th we unveiled we have these giant 
working eclipse glasses. So we have one pair that is eight foot wide that currently lives at the planetarium. <laughs> we have a six, one six foot pair that lives at SUNY Brockport, who sponsored all of our eclipse classes. And then we have three giant pairs that are meant to travel. So we'll be bringing them to festivals, to outreach, oh. uh, to events. We're heavily promoting. I've uh, even I've brought them to events already, and they thankfully fit into my car. Oh they may have goodness. been measured to fit into my car, but uh, <laughs> what was it? This past April 8th, we even like toured around the region with a pair, you know, doing videos, doing photos at different landmarks, different partners. And the fact that they work is incredible. Hmm. Uh, all you have to do is, you know, you can buy the material in rolls and just sandwich it in between two sheets of plexiglass. And that's something that we have been talking with the Adler Planetarium, who did a very similar thing back in 2017. Yeah, just the Mylar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. And so we're like, let's scale up. And then we also have a 10, we have several 10 foot inflatable suns. And then we have a scale one inch earth and quarter inch moon on a yardstick that's 30 inches apart. So on the yardstick, the Earth and the Moon, that's actually a kit developed by the Astro Society of the Pacific. We then did the math and figured out a 10-foot sun is basically the correct scale. And as we're doing the math, we figured out the distance it would have to be, and it works perfectly on our grounds. That if we put the sun on one part of our grounds and have this yardstick about a uh, thousand and seventy four feet away on the other part of our grounds. And thankfully, we have a park as part of our property. Uh, it's the scale and distance and in size. Huh. So you can actually simulate the total solar eclipse on your on your yard, basically. Yes, that's pretty wild. I've, I've not heard of that yet. Uh, uh, yeah. We were lucky that the math worked out. Yeah. Now, is there any registration fee for? Registering for your event? Not yet. We're planning on opening tickets either at the end of summer or early fall. Okay. Uh, just because we're trying to iron out final details, trying to plan some of the flow in and out of the museum, all of that. And we have a number of buildings on our campus. And so we're trying to figure what's going to be used for what, when's going to what things are going to take place when uh, we're even talking about renting some high quality projectors to, you know, during the day, do live streams onto the side of the building, mm -hmm. but at night, maybe doing a moving night. So we're trying to add in all the different parts. Okay. Yeah. You have local astronomy clubs there that are working with you as well. Very closely. So we're working with, uh, they're called ASRAS, uh, our local, Astronomy group, they are fantastic to work with. They've also been helping us out with this ambassador program that we got funded, uh, thanks to Science Sandbox. So we've brought on 50 organizations from across the nine counties. We're pro we've provided them with a half day training and thanks to the funding, we are giving them a telescope, solar filter, a sun, moon, earth model, uh, two colanders for pinhole viewing. Oh my. Uh, a thousand glasses to give out for free into the community, stickers, hoodies, patches, and a thousand dollars to their organization as well. Wow, fantastic! Yeah, astronomy clubs they really work well with this type of event, you know, they're more than eager to help. Usually, oh, I see them on a almost daily basis. Uh, <laughs> a number of them are presenters at the planetarium as well. So, oh, okay, yeah. Very good. A lot of hallway chat. Uh, <laughs> just they run the telescopes out of our observatory on top of the planetarium. They have been helping out at a lot of the trainings. We're doing a lot of the outreach together. A lot of solar observing during the lead up, and a lot of night observing as well. Okay. So it's been a lot of fun working with them. We even partnered up back in 2021 for the partial. Uh, which was at 5.30 in the morning, which setting up an event at 4 in the morning is a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but 
we partnered up together and we had several hundred people at one location. We had another couple hundred at another. And I think we had maybe 12 to 1500 people between the locations at five in the morning, five thirty oh, in the morning. My goodness. That's great. People were excited. And I mean, we ran out yeah. of glasses at both those locations, which we are not making that mistake again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As we were ordering like between 400 and 500,000 eclipse glasses for the region. Oh my goodness. Good. School's going to get them as well. Yes. So we're partnering with a lot of schools, uh, either providing them outright or providing them in bulk for very cheap. Surprisingly, some of the schools had already bought in the glasses before we could even reach them. Hmm. Which yeah, is because in 2017, they were hard to get at the end. Yes. They were very almost near them. And again, you were paying premium price for them. So, and we've, kind of set the ceiling on price for the region for them as well, which makes us really happy. Good. Uh, of, you know, only $2.50. That, that's a bargain. That's a bargain. I might order mine from you. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll put it in the mail for you. <laughs> that's great. So other than the, uh, the Rock the Eclipse event, do you have any other events going on? Some of the events that we have in the region, uh, in addition to the festival, there's other festivals taking place down the street from us. There's community centers, there's parks, there's libraries. We've been working on making sure that everyone is activated and the nearest Eclipse event should hopefully only be down the street or in your neighborhood or only five minutes away. Leading up to the Eclipse, we're doing concerts. We have an Eclipse concert at the Planetarium coming up. We have a eclipse day at uh the rochester red wings which is a minor league baseball team Hmm. so we put something big there uh we're going to as many places as possible we're trying to do as many events as possible we've already held uh yuri's night in celebration of the eclipse leading up to it we did a one year out event a big press event anything that we can do to get that word out we're okay trying to get that word out okay and you're coordinating obviously with the museum and the local club what about other organizations you want to give a shout out to that are working with you so uh in addition to you know the folks that i've mentioned before you know the genesee transportation council visit rochester and kids out and about we've been heavily working with our ymcas Mm -hmm. the libraries uh the park systems Uh, all the parks and rec departments have been a lot of fun to work with we uh, a couple months ago we had the New York State Park system come and visit the museum. They were already in town for a conference, and we did a two-hour training with them yeah. that included, you know, talking about the eclipse and then getting them hands-on was uh, with telescopes doing solar viewing. Uh, they were a ton of fun to work with. They were very similar to museum educators. Okay. Uh, they had that same energy. Good. Uh, it's. Let's see, working with all the breweries, you know, personally, that's been a lot of fun. <laughs> I bet. Same with the chocolate people, <laughs> uh, the libraries. I personally love our library system and have worked with them for years. We actually, in 2019, partnered up uh, just as an individual. I partnered up with them to develop hands-on activities celebrating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Uh, I actually got contacted by our central library. They have a secret room. And I got to, you know, map out the constellations into their ceiling for them. Oh, my. Uh, which they, you know, added fiber optic lights to pull off. They've also been able to track down the history of Eclipse the last time that we had one here in Rochester, which was 1925. And they gathered about a dozen articles for me. Oh, for that's great. My favorite story is what is... Now, the Pont de Rennes Bridge in Rochester in 1925 had several thousand people on it, and it started to crack. And there are photos of this crack. That they were observing the eclipse from there? From that bridge. And, Uh, and, you know, early January 1925, uh, I, I guess the conditions were just right that, you know... Things started to not look so good for a little bit. Oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> uh, but don't that hold, don't hold an event there. <laughs> yes. Funny enough, it'll be under construction. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Uh, it sounds like you guys have a lot planned. You got your hands yeah, full. Yeah, and uh, new things keep popping up. Uh, as of two weeks ago, we talked to Mount Hope Cemetery, which is uh, one of the largest cemeteries in the region and has Susan B. Anthony and Fred McDouglas in it. Hmm. They actually started talking to us about doing astronomy walks through the planet, uh, through the cemetery and even be a solar viewing location, uh, uh, a viewing location for the eclipse. The more areas Which, you get, the better. I was never, I wasn't expecting to, you know, start talking to cemeteries, but here we are. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. Everybody wants to be involved. It's great. So you have any, 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 you have any other additional information I can share with our audience? Uh, just reach out to everyone. Uh, you know, the big thing that we've been pushing in Rochester is that literally everyone under the sun is a stakeholder in the eclipse. And I have actually said that exact phrase way too many times, but <laughs> it's... Yeah, I see that term on your uh, your website, stakeholder. I, I'm almost at the point of getting that tattooed on myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and exactly what do you deem a stakeholder for the eclipse? Uh, anyone who wants to host anyone, anyone who wants to support Eclipse efforts, anyone who's helping get people to look up in the sky. And, you know, we've been working hard to make sure that everyone's included and that no one misses out. Uh, we've been working on getting all of our materials translated into Spanish. Hmm. Rochester has one of the largest deaf populations. And so we're working with interpreters. Oh, fantastic. Uh, we've been creating sensory safe locations for the eclipse eclipses are heavy on the senses yeah they are and so we've been working with our local autism up and making sure that they're covered our senior homes our veteran orgs our uh pre-k and kindergarten everyone good good fantastic well it sounds like you're well on your way to hosting an awesome event uh, I would say I can't wait, but there's so much work still left to yeah. do. Now, are you constantly updating your website with lodging and things like that to add? Working on it. We're working okay. on a couple new updates to add to the website. Uh, I know we want to redo the front page as we've been running the website since 2018. And a lot of the front page and goal has been activation for the stakeholders. But now we're trying to turn it to more of the public. Okay. And do you guys have a Facebook page for the event as well? Yep. So okay. you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Rock Solar Eclipse. And then the hashtag for the region is Rock Eclipse 2024. Great. And I will add those links to the show notes for the podcast as well. So people can just click on them there. All right, Dan. So if anybody's interested, they get a hold of you. Any uh anytime at D Schneiderman at rmsc.org. Uh, it's been crazy that my entire job at the museum is just the eclipse. And, uh, I would welcome anyone to come to Rochester. Okay. Well, great. We will get it out there and hopefully we help you out with attendance. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. I again, I want to thank Daniel for coming on the podcast and give us an update of what's going on in Rochester, New York for the 2024 Total Solar Eclipse. And if you're going to be attending there, please leave a note in the show notes or please let us know where you're going to be going to observe the eclipse. We upload a new episode of the Observer's Notebook on the 1st and 15th of every month. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. If you do, please rate and review us. I really appreciate it. And you can also listen to us on Apple Radio, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google Play, Stitcher, Amazon Echo, Spotify, and we're also on the YouTube channel. And if you listen to us on the YouTube channel, please give us a thumbs up and a like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. 
You can help support the podcast by donating to it via Patreon. You can give it as little as $35, up to $35 a month, where you receive one year's membership to the Alpo and producer credits on the podcast. And with that, I'd like to thank the producers of this podcast, Steve Seedentop and Michael Moyer, for their continued generous support. The link for Patreon, as well as the link for the Alpo, is in the show notes. And if you'd like to get a hold of me, my email address is cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at at ObserversNBPod. Until next time, I hope you always have clear and steady skies. Thanks for listening.